got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm suddenly arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And, went, and they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, how many of you have ever been at sea on a boat? Big boat or little boat? What? Both? Little. Big and little, okay. What we're going to do is you're going to pretend you're at sea this time, all right? Now, when the boat starts rocking, I want to see some. I want to see some fear in your eyes out there. I want to see. I want to see this little first-century wooden sailing ship. I want to see you look like the disciple on the boat. All right. A windstorm suddenly arose on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Some of you don't know what being swamped by waves looks like. <laughs> Can you demonstrate for me? You're a good actress. Come up here. Both of you guys, come up here. Hannah, you want to join these guys up here a minute? Kaylee, you want to come up? Abby, you come up. You're a good actress. Anybody who's a good actor or actress, come on up. Clark, come on up. Clark, you can come up. Here come all the kids again. Anybody who wants to come up, come on up. These guys can sell a story, I tell you that right now. Here comes Theo. Come on, Theo. You know how to rock and roll, baby. Yeah, I want you guys to yell and everything, right? You're going to really lay it on thick here. Okay. All right. When Jesus got into the boat, the disciples followed him. A windstorm suddenly arose on the sea. So great was the boat, the boat was being swamped by the waves. You're in a boat, Abby. You're in a boat. Let me see some terror on your faces. And they went and they woke him up and saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. <laughs> Let me hear, Lord, save us, we're perishing. Lord, save us. Can you all say that? Lord, save us. You wouldn't say that. If you were in a boat and the water was coming over your head, you would say, Lord, save us. You'd say, Lord, save us. Save us. Now, this is great stuff. All right, thank you. You can all go sit down now. We're talking a first century wooden sailing ship on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee wasn't really a sea, it was an inland lake. It's about 13 miles from top to bottom and it's not that wide. But Jesus was exhausted, he was tired. People had been coming to him in droves, needing to be healed, bringing their children, bringing their grandchildren, bringing their friends because they knew that there was no hope with a doctor that day. If you could afford a doctor, you were scared to go to one. Doctors were for the ruling classes of people and what they did to you was probably scarier than being sick. They would bring their children and their people to Jesus just saying, if he just put his hand on them, they'll be, they'll be fine because we've heard what he does. We've heard what he does. He's capable of all these things. He was exhausted. So he gets in the boat to go across and the crowd follows him on the side. But as often happens on the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Genesaret, which now is sort of the reservoir for Jerusalem, that's where they get their water from, this storm can come very quickly. And on this little boat, the water was coming over, not just over the bow, over their heads. They were scared to death, and they started yelling for Jesus. And what does he do? Before he calms the sea, he looks at them and says, you of little faith. So I want to ask you, there are different forms of the word wake, right? You know what it is to wake up, right? What would you call a rude awakening? Maybe have an example of a rude awakening? An alarm clock. Amen. My alarm went off this morning at 5.15, and it was a rude, I was already awake, but it was pretty rude, that sound. Now, my cousin, her children are grown now, but she had a daughter first, and her daughter was a sweet little girl who said, thank you, Mommy, and she put her in the crib and said, it's time for a nap, and she laid down and go to sleep. She said, it's time to eat, and her little daughter would come to the table and eat. And she had a boy named Ricky. <laughs> 
who took things apart. When he was a baby, he climbed the door and took the hinges off just to see how it worked, and the door crashed, and she was very tired. I like Jesus, and I said, what's wrong? And she said, I would like to change my son's name on his birth certificate. I said, to what? And she said, rude awakening. <laughs> okay. So what does it mean to be woke in today's parlance? What does it mean to be woke? It's the past tense of waken. How many of you think to be woke is a good thing? It sort of depends on what political station you watch, right? How many of you think being woke is just one of those liberal crazy things? You don't have to raise your hand for that. You can just think that. To woke is to be alerted to something. And in the case of social issues, it's to be awoke to prejudice or discrimination, things like that. That's what it means to be woke. But other people think it means to be too liberal for words. What's a wake-up call? How many of you get a wake-up call in the morning from your mom or dad? What was that? Somebody said an answer back there. What's a wake-up call, Abby? What did you say? Someone wakes you up. How many of you ever go into a hotel and left a wake-up call at the desk? Yep. You do that, right? What's a wake-up call in terms of idioms? Like, what does it mean to say, that was a real wake-up call for me? A realization, an aha moment. Lots of times it happened with health, right? Some people say my blood pressure was high, it was a wake-up call, that I need to change the way I eat, the way I sleep, the way I do some things. So what was this? When they get Jesus up out of the boat, is it a rude awakening? Is it a wake-up call? Is it being woke? What is it? I think it's kind of all of the above, because for Jesus it was a rude awakening. He's sound asleep. They come and shake him. Mom, can I tell your story, what you did the other night to me? Can I, Mom? My mother's back there. Can I? All right. She said yes, didn't she? I scared my mother because I, they changed the medication for my arm pain, and I fell asleep watching television for the first sound sleep I'd had in four weeks. My mother thought I had died or entered a coma, and she starts yelling and shaking me and saying, wake up, wake up, and I went, what the heck? Sort of. And then she yelled because she said, why are you yelling at me? And I'm like, you're yelling at me. And then she started crying, don't yell at me. And I was like, mom, really, seriously? She thought I was dead or something. She's been staying with me since I don't function very well on my own with one arm anymore. That was a rude awakening, a little bit. She did it out of love. I know, I know, I love my mom. You still love me, don't you, mom? Cricket, 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 cricket. I think it's all three with Jesus because it was a rude awakening to him. He was exhausted. And they shake him and they say, what are you doing, Jesus? Don't you know we're going to die? Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. It was being woke because they were alerted to something that might happen to them. And they wanted Jesus to be part of it. I think it was a wake-up call for them when Jesus says, where, why are you afraid you have little faith? You know what bottom line this story means to me? I don't fault the disciples. They were scared. They should have had faith, but they were scared. How many of you have faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? How many have faith in his ability to help you when you need help? How many of you have faith in his ability to change things when they need to be changed? How many of you still get scared sometimes? The thing is, they got scared, but they knew exactly where to go, didn't they? They knew where to go. They went to him and they said, wake up, Lord. I can't tell you the number of times in my life I had to wake up Jesus in my boat. Anybody else ever feel that way? You had to wake him up sometimes? We were going to pray for the safety of schools and teachers and administrators and lunch ladies and men. We are going to pray for everybody who ever went into a school as a custodian or to teach a gym class or if you work in the office or if you're a secretary or if you're an administrator at a college campus because we have folks like that in this congregation as well. We're going to pray for them every day. Why are we going to do that every day? Because we believe that God is with us every moment of every day. We need to feel that. But you know what's going to happen when you start praying for people, right? You know, the, anybody read my blog a couple weeks ago? What happens when you start praying for people is it changes you. 
We don't pray to change God. We pray to change ourselves, right? You're going to be bolder if you start praying. You're going to be really bold. You're going to start praying, and it's going to become a habit. You're going to picture every kid in this congregation. You're going to pray for their safety. I know those of you who are parents and grandparents pray for your little ones every day, right? We need to get to the point where every child is important to us. It's the ones who are related to us. We got to get to the point where every child beyond those that we love in this congregation are just as important to us. We got to get to the point where children in other places are just as important to us. I've been praying for the kids in Ukraine every day for so long now because we have to pray for kids. And you know what happens when you start praying for them? You start to care about them. You know what happens? When you start to care about them. You start to become more involved with them. What I've said we're going to do this year, we're going to become more involved with Fedonia International Elementary School. Jenny Torres couldn't be here today because she's out having a little bit of vacation. She's camping in the woods. And I hope she doesn't fall down and break anything. But she's going to come and see us in a couple of weeks and talk to us about how we can be more involved. We have children who need somebody to read to them in school every day. We've got people here who know how to read. Raise your hand if you know how to read. Wow. You could become involved in the school that way. We have Fredonia International Elementary wants to set up a clothing closet. They don't know how to do that. We're going to help them because we know how to set up a clothing closet. So we've got the Thrifty Penny over here, and the Thrifty Penny's been sending them some clothes. That's one way to be involved. And we could really be woke, and you know what you could do? You could start advocating on a level above that. You could go to the political world, which is not a dirty word, and you could advocate. You could advocate for sane gun laws in this country so that people don't have to be afraid to send their children to school. There's a lot of difference between the Second Amendment standing and what we have now, which is just not enough. When an 18-year-old is free to go out and buy 300 rounds of ammunition and a semi-automatic rifle, and then another semi-automatic rifle, and nobody notices that is a problem. So however woke you want to be, you can be. You can respond however you want to respond, but we're called to respond in the name of Jesus Christ. Because that's how you wake up Jesus in your boat. I'll tell you a story that happened to me when I was 16 years old. When I was 15, I found out I met an angel, actually. Let me tell you the whole story. I met an angel when I was 15 years old. My parents were in a car accident in a Volkswagen Beetle. The only time my father has never driven a Ford in his life was during the 1970s, during the, the gas crisis. He bought a Volkswagen Beetle. I can tell you this. When I was 16 years old, I was 15 when it started. I never went to the grocery store with my parents. Why? Because I was just too cool for that. One night, they said, you want to go to the store with us? I was like, okay. I got in the back of the Volkswagen, with my feet on the seat, and my father pulled out in front of the biggest Buick I've ever seen hit the car, hit me right in the back. It was pouring down rain. This was on Ridgely Road, because remember, I grew up around here. On Ridgely Road, in front of what used to be the A&P. For those of you who've been here a long time, you know where that was. And a man showed up in the middle of this intersection in the pouring rain immediately. He was a short man with a raincoat on. He said to my father, your daughter needs an ambulance. My father said, she's fine. My father's face was bleeding. My mother had broken ribs. But the man said, your daughter needs an ambulance. I think it was an angel. And just then an ambulance pulled up. This is before cell phones were even thought of, much less invented. This is when you had to walk quite a ways to get to a pay phone if you could find one. And an ambulance showed up, and they put me in the ambulance. They took me to GBMC. Went to the emergency room. I had an x-ray. Nothing was wrong with me. My parents got stitched up and bandaged up. They sent us all home. The next day, someone called from the hospital. It was not the radiologist when he had the, the x-ray on the thing. Somebody who was filing it in an envelope to put away on the shelf noticed something and called my parents and said, your daughter needs to see a surgeon right away. Because my ovaries, which are the size of a walnut, had a cyst on one of them the size of a grapefruit. It had twisted my fallopian tube. I was within two weeks of dropping dead. Because they said it would be like having a thousand appendices explode at once. Then they said to my parents on the phone, the weird thing is these things don't show up on x-rays. So here I am. I had a sweet 16 party. All my girlfriends cried and said, we're going to miss you when you're dead, which is not fun. Because <laughs> I had to have surgery as soon as possible. And it wasn't that the surgery was dangerous, but the year before I'd had rheumatic fever. And the surgeon looked at me very bluntly. She was a blunt lady, said to me, Surgery's not dangerous, but the anesthesia might kill you. It's a lot to hear when you're 15 years old, getting ready to turn 16. 
I turned 16 on the 29th of January, had my surgery on Valentine's Day. What a fun Valentine's Day that was. And my parents said goodbye to me in the hospital the night before my surgery, and they went home. And that was the first night I prayed like the disciples. That's the first night I said, Jesus, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. I spent my whole life believing in God. I've been going to church my entire life. I told you I was baptized in the old Epworth Church on Cockeysville Road. I believed in Jesus. This was the first time I needed him to wake up. And that night I prayed, I said, if you're there, Lord, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you, Lord, if you're there, I need you so badly, let me know you're here with me. And I expected, with that kind of prayer, I expect, you know, the old, let Jesus into your heart, I expected the angels to drop down, singing the holy chorus. I expected some big technicolor miracle kind of show. I got none of that, but I woke up the next morning, you know what I knew? Everything was okay, no matter what happened, everything was all right, everything was going to be fine, no matter what happened, whether... I lived or died, everything was okay. And I lived. God was with me. Sometimes you gotta wake Jesus up, don't you? Doesn't mean you don't have any faith, but it means sometimes you gotta wake up your faith. We're gonna wake up our faith when it comes to teachers and students. We're gonna take care of them. Let this be a wake up call to all of us that we need to change the way things are done in society. We need to pay attention to teenagers with, mentally, with mental illness. We need to pay attention when kids are depressed or withdrawn. So I was just saying that kid's odd, stay away from him. We need to look at them and we need to help them out. Which is why today we're going to pray not just for the teachers and the students and the parents and grandparents. We're going to pray for those who may do harm to others. Because Jesus Christ calls us to pray for even our enemies. Anyone who hurts a child feels like an enemy, but we need to pray for them as well. But before we do that, we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns. I don't know how we're going to play it this morning. Because White folks tend to sing, when the storm's life rages at my feet, when the storm's life rages at my feet, like it's a march. The way it was written by Charles Albert Tindley, an African-American hymn writer, was, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me, like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. Every prayer, I want those words to sink into your heart. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell is hell, and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can, and my friends must understand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in battle array undertake to stop my way, they all who saved Paul and Silas stand by me. Then the one that fits me these days, when I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden and I'm nearing Chili Jordan, oh, thou lily of the valley, stand by me. I invite you now to stand and sing together. Hymn number 512 from the United Methodist Hymnal, Stand By Me. Mm -hmm. 